My girlfriend just summoned something terrible. She found the Necronomicon, also known as the Book of the Dead. There's a type of silence that only exists in places where people don't usually go. Not just a lack of sound, but something heavier. A weight that presses down on everything until the air feels different. I noticed at the moment we got out of the car, the trees around us stood perfectly still. No wind, no birds, just quiet. Are you sure about this? I asked, glancing over at her. Megan was already pulling the backpack out of the trunk. Her movements quick, almost too eager. She looked different out here. Something in her eyes was sharper, more focused. Of course I am, she said without looking at me, tossing the bag over her shoulder. You promised you'd do this. I hadn't. Not exactly. But somehow, Megan had a way of turning half agreements into commitments. When she'd first brought up this whole trip, it seemed like one of her usual whims. She loved the weird and obscure. Tarot cards, conspiracy theories. I went along with it because it was her, and that was enough. This, though. This was different. This wasn't just a weekend in the woods. The cabin was more dilapidated than I expected, even after the warning she'd given me. The wood was splintered, the windows boarded up, but there was something strange about how intact it remained, despite the obvious years of neglect. It sat low in the clearing, like it had settled into the earth. A part of the landscape, instead of a building someone had left behind, the door creaked as Megan pushed it open, a sound that cut through the silence like it didn't belong here. After you, she said with a grin, stepping back to let me inside. It took a second for my eyes to adjust to the dim light. The only windows were small, letting in slivers of the overcast sky. There was no furniture, just a stone fireplace against one wall and dust thick enough to choke on. I coughed into my sleeve and Megan laughed. It's perfect, isn't it? Yeah, sure. If you're into places where serial killers dump bodies, I replied. She rolled her eyes and moved past me, heading for the center of the room. She dumped the backpack onto the floor, and for the first time, I noticed how carefully she was moving. There was purpose in everything she did. She knelt and started pulling out candles, arranging them in a wide circle around us. I watched uneasy as she lit each one. Uh, what's with the setup? I asked. She didn't answer right away. Just kept working until the last flame flickered to life. Then she stood and stepped back, her face glowing in the candlelight. She looked at me with an intensity that made my skin prickle. We're gonna do something incredible tonight, she said. Something real. I shifted on my feet, feeling that familiar sense of discomfort I got whenever she started talking like this. I tried to keep it light. You, uh, you brought me all the way out here for a seance or something? Not a seance, she began. More like a ritual. She reached into the bag again, and this time when she pulled her hand back out, she was holding a book. I didn't recognize it at first. It was old, that much was obvious, with cracked leather binding and pages that looked fragile enough to crumble at a touch. But as she held it out to me, I felt the air in the room change. It was subtle, but undeniable. What is that? I asked. Open it. Her voice was quiet but firm. I hesitated. Where'd you even get this? Her lips twitched into a small smile, but she didn't answer the question. It's called the Necronomicon. The word sounded strange coming from her. She usually laughed at stuff like this 
movies about ancient curses, paranormal documentaries. But now she was very serious. I mean it, Megan, where did you get this? It doesn't matter, she replied. She stepped closer, pushing the book into my hands. What matters is what's inside. I looked down at the cover, rough under my fingers. You expect me to believe this is real? Like actual real? I asked. Her gaze didn't waver. Just read it, please. I swallowed, feeling a sudden dryness in my throat. Something about the way she was acting made it hard to refuse even though every instinct told me to put the book down and run out of there. But then again, I'd never been able to say no to her. I thumbed through the first few pages, barely able to make out the words. They were in a language I didn't recognize, full of strange symbols and shapes that seemed to blur if I stared too long. This doesn't make any sense, I said. I can't read this. Not yet, she said softly, but soon. Keep going. I flipped through a few more pages, my unease growing with every turn. The symbols seemed to shift, almost pulsing on the page. I wanted to close the book, but something made me keep going. My eyes started to catch on certain shapes, and a word, just one, started to form in my mind. I heard Megan whisper something under her breath, a sound so faint, I wasn't sure if I was imagining it. What did you say? I asked. Her eyes were wide, fixed on the book. It's working. I didn't know what she meant by that. All I knew was that the air in the cabin felt even heavier now, thick with something I couldn't explain. It was like the room was getting smaller, the walls pressing in. All right, Megan, this isn't funny anymore, I said, closing the book. And the moment I did, the strange tension in the air eased a little, but not completely. Look, let's just go back, all right? Her smile faded, and for a second she looked almost disappointed, but then she stepped forward and took the book from my hands. But we only just started, she said. You have to trust me. I didn't want to trust her. I didn't want to be here anymore. But something about the way she said it, I don't know, the look in her eyes, it was like she believed, really believed, that whatever was happening was something important. I don't know, something bigger than us. She knelt down inside the circle of candles again and placed the book carefully in front of her. Her fingers traced over the cover, and for a moment, she just stared at it like she was waiting for something. I stood there unsure of what to do when she began to speak. At first, it sounded like gibberish, those same strange words from the book slipping off her tongue like she'd practiced them for years. The more she spoke, the more I felt that same pressure in the room again. The candles flickered, casting weird shapes across the walls, and the air seemed to pulse with every word. I wanted to tell her to stop, but I couldn't get the words out. I just stood there watching as her voice grew louder, more confident, and then without warning, she just stopped. For a second, everything was still. I could hear my own breathing louder than it should have been. And then I heard something else, a faint sound, like a low rumble coming from beneath us. Megan, what the hell is that? She didn't answer, just stood slowly, her eyes fixed on the floor. The sound grew louder a deep rhythmic sound, like something moving underground. I backed up, feeling the walls pressing in. Okay, that's enough. We need to leave now. But Megan didn't move. She just stared at the floor, 
her expression unreadable. The sound grew louder, more insistent, and I could feel it vibrating through the soles of my feet. Megan, I said, grabbing her arm. She jerked away from me, her eyes finally meeting mine. And there was something in them I didn't recognize. Something wild, almost frantic. You don't understand, she said. This is what we wanted. The hell are you talking about? We need to go, I replied. Before I could finish, the ground beneath us buckled with a force that knocked me off my feet. I hit the floor hard. The sound, whatever it was, was deafening now, filling the whole cabin. I scrambled to my feet, but Megan was still standing there, completely still, her eyes locked on the center of the room. I followed her gaze, and I saw it. The floorboards were splitting apart, slow at first and then faster, the wood groaning as something pushed up from below. I didn't wait to see what it was. I grabbed Megan's arm and yanked her towards the door, but she resisted. Let go, she said. I need to see this. Are you crazy? We need to get out of here now, I said. But she didn't listen. She turned back to the widening crack in the floor, her face illuminated by the flickering candlelight. And then, as if in response to her gaze, something began to rise from the darkness. It was impossible to make out at first, just a black shape pushing its way up through the floorboards, shifting and moving like it was alive. The room filled with a stench of decay. Megan, come on, I said, but my voice was barely audible over the deafening noise. The thing in the floor was growing, spreading outwards, tendrils of darkness reaching up towards the ceiling. I could feel it pulling at me, a force so strong I had to fight to just stand up. Megan though, she seemed completely transfixed. She stepped closer to the thing, her face pale in the candlelight. She whispered something again, those same strange words I think. And for a moment, it was like the thing was listening to her. And then with a sudden burst of movement, one of the tendrils shot forward, wrapping itself around her leg. She gasped, but she didn't scream. Her eyes wide as the thing began to pull her towards the crack in the floor. I ran forward without thinking, grabbing her arms and pulling with everything I had. The force was stronger than I expected, like trying to pull her from quicksand. Let go, she cried, but I didn't listen. With one final desperate pull, I yanked her free, and we both tumbled backwards, crashing into the far wall. The thing let out a sound, an inhuman sound, and then the crack in the floor snapped shut, as if it had never been there. For a moment, everything was still. Megan and I just lay there, the candles flickering around us. My mind was racing. There were no answers, no explanation, just the sense that whatever had been unleashed wasn't gone. Okay, we need to leave now, I said. But a strange smile spread across her face, slow and almost childlike. Did you see that? It worked. It actually worked. I grabbed her arm harder than I intended. Megan, what the hell is wrong with you? We're getting out of here now. But she jerked her arm free, laughing softly. Get out. Why would we do that? Don't you understand? We did it. We brought something through. This is what I've always wanted. I just stared at her. Are you hearing yourself? That thing almost killed you. But it didn't, she said, stepping closer to me, her eyes wide. It wanted to show us more. Don't you feel it? 
There's more here. We're just scratching the surface. My heart sank. I didn't know what had happened to her, but Megan wasn't the same person I thought she was. There was a wildness in her eyes, a hunger I had never seen before. A low rumble sounded beneath us again, quieter this time. It was still there, whatever it was. We have to find it, Megan said, her voice barely a whisper. We have to see what's waiting for us down there. No, no way. I am not going down there and neither are you. But Megan didn't seem to hear me. She moved toward the far wall, the one next to the fireplace, and began running her hands over it, searching for something. Her fingers found the edge of a small door nearly hidden in the shadows. She pried it open, revealing a narrow staircase that led downward into the dark. Basement, she said, as if the word held all the answers. My mouth went dry. I didn't want to go down there. But before I could stop her, she grabbed a half burned candle from the floor and ran towards the stairs. She looked back and grinned at me. And then she disappeared into the darkness. I followed her. God help me. I followed her. The air down there was damp, heavy with the smell of mold and rot. I could hear Megan's soft footsteps ahead of me, and the flickering light from the candle barely helped with the darkness. When we reached the bottom, the basement opened up into a strange wide chamber lined with old stone walls. But it wasn't the kind of basement I'd expected. It was more like an ancient ruin buried beneath the cabin, something far older than the house itself. The walls were carved with symbols, much like the ones in the book, etched deep into the stone. And then, just beyond the reach of the candlelight, I could see the tunnels, narrow passages twisting off into the darkness, forming a labyrinth beneath the earth. What is this place? I asked. Megan was already walking toward one of the tunnels her excitement practically radiating off her. It's incredible, isn't it? This is where it all leads. Before I could catch her, she disappeared into the tunnel, her footsteps echoing softly. I cursed under my breath and hurried after her, my skin crawling with the sense that something was watching us. The deeper we went, the colder the air became and the more oppressive it felt. Megan, slow down, I called. But she didn't respond. And when I rounded a corner, I nearly ran into her. She'd stopped in the middle of the tunnel, her eyes wide with fascination, as she stared at something up ahead. I looked where she was looking and froze. At first, I couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. There was something moving in the tunnel, small, hunched, no taller than a child. Their faces were distorted, and there were dozens of them scuttling along the walls and floor, their eyes glowing faintly in the dark. Megan's breath stopped, but instead of fear, there was awe in her voice. They're beautiful. I grabbed her arm and yanked her back. Are you out of your mind? We need to get out of here now. But she just kept staring at the creatures as they crept closer. Her face lit up with something like joy. Don't you see? They're real. All of it's real. I don't care, I said. We need to go. I started pulling her back toward the entrance, but the creatures moved faster than I expected. They skittered along the walls, 
their strange, unnatural movements making my skin crawl. One of them dropped down in front of us, blocking the tunnel with its twisted body. Its eyes locked on Megan, and it let out a low, guttural sound. Megan's eyes went wide, and she took a step forward like she wanted to hug it. Don't touch it, I said. But it was too late. Her fingers brushed against the creature's skin, and the thing let out a noise that I still remember. It was a sickening, wet gurgle, like something drowning in mud. It recoiled, but instead of attacking, it slunk back into the shadows. Megan turned to me, her eyes wide with a manic glee. They're not here to hurt us, they're here to show us the way. They're part of this, part of the book, don't you get it? We're part of it now. I shook my head, backing away from her. This is insane. I don't know what happened to you, but you're not thinking straight and we need to get the hell out of here. But she just smiled, that same unsettling grin, and she turned back to the tunnel. There's more, I can feel it. She started moving quickly again, deeper into the maze, and I followed her. The creatures, whatever they were, watched us from the edges of the tunnel, their glowing eyes tracking our movements, but they didn't come closer. It was like they were waiting for something. We passed through another twisting passage, the air growing colder. I could hear faint noises now, whispers maybe. The tunnel opened up into a wider chamber, and I felt my stomach drop. The walls were lined with cages, rusted metal bars twisted into strange organic shapes. Inside each cage was something wrong. Some of them were humanoid, like the creatures in the tunnel, but others were larger, twisted into monstrous forms. There was every type of creature down there. Everything I'd ever imagined in my most terrible nightmares. Megan stepped toward one of the cages, her breath quickening. They've been waiting here for us. I grabbed her by the shoulders, forcing her to look at me. Megan, this is insane. We need to get out of here before something else happens. But she just laughed. But this is what I wanted, don't you see? We've tapped into something bigger than us. Bigger than anything. I want to know more. This wasn't just some game to her anymore. She was obsessed. Consumed. Suddenly, the demonic creatures in the cages began to thrash wildly, their bodies slamming against the bars. I didn't wait to see if the cages would hold. Megan, please, we need to go. And just as I said that, one of the creatures began to laugh. It slammed its head against the metal, and the cage began to bend. Within seconds it broke. The creature stepped out of it and towered over us. It stood blocking the way we'd come from. And for the first time, I could see that Megan was afraid. We sprinted the only way we could, deeper into the maze, the tunnel narrowing as we went. The walls felt closer now, and behind us I could hear that thing following. The tunnel twisted and turned, each passage looking more like the last, and I had no idea where we were. I glanced over at Megan. And despite everything, she was smiling. She was breathing hard, but there was a gleam in her eyes that hadn't been there before. She liked this. The danger, the madness. It was like she was feeding off it. We turned a corner and nearly collided with another creature. This one even bigger. Its skin was slick and wet. And it had more than two arms. Look at it. She began. It's 
but I didn't let her finish. I grabbed her arm and pulled her to the side, narrowly avoiding the thing's reach. We ducked into another tunnel, and this one sloped sharply downward. The deeper we went, the worse the air became. Where are we going? Megan asked. I don't know, I said. Away from whatever those things are? The tunnels were endless, spiraling in every direction, but none of them felt like an escape. How much further can this go? I said. Megan didn't answer. She was too busy marveling at the creatures around us, her eyes wide with fascination. And then I saw something, a glimmer of metal in the distance, barely visible through the light. You see that? I asked. She squinted, her expression shifting from curiosity to recognition. It's an elevator. I wasn't sure how she knew, but I didn't care. I dragged her towards it, the creatures closing in behind us. The tunnel opened up into a small chamber, and there standing in the center was an old rusted elevator. It looked ancient. It had a grated door and a crank on the side. Get in, this has to lead back up, I said. I yanked open the door and the metal screeched in protest. The platform was barely big enough for the two of us. I pulled her inside and slammed the door just as one of the creatures lunged at us from the tunnel. I turned the crank as fast as I could, the mechanism groaning as it began to lift us up. The demons gathered at the base of the elevator, their twisted faces pressed against the grate, eyes glowing as they watched us rise. I kept turning the crank, my arms burning. The elevator creaked and groaned, but it kept rising, pulling us away from the nightmare below. And Megan was still smiling, her eyes locked on the creatures down there. She looked almost disappointed as they faded from view, like she was losing something she cared about. I can't believe we found this. We've seen them, you know, we've really seen them, she said. I didn't respond. I'd had enough. I just kept cranking the elevator, praying it would get us out of here before something else went wrong. We ascended slowly, the walls of the shaft closing in around us, and the wails of the creatures faded into the distance. But the further up we went, the more I wondered what was waiting for us at the top. The elevator shuddered as we continued our slow ascent, the walls creaking and groaning like they might collapse at any moment. Megan was still staring down. She seemed disappointed. She wanted to go back down there. You don't understand, she said. We were so close to something incredible. I didn't say anything back. The elevator jolted as it reached the top, and I let out a shaky breath. I shoved the grated door open, and Megan stepped out first, still holding that damn candle. The cabin seemed different now, darker, even though we were back on the first floor. But I didn't care we were getting out of here. I was not staying in this place one second longer. All right, come on, I said, grabbing her wrist and pulling her toward the front door. She followed, though her steps were slow and reluctant. We made it to the porch, the cold night air hitting my face like a splash of water. Freedom. It was right there, just a few steps away. The car was still parked at the edge of the clearing, and our escape route was waiting. I took one step forward. But my foot hit something solid. It was like I'd slammed into an invisible wall. I stumbled back, confused. I tried again, pushing harder this time. But there was something blocking me. I couldn't leave the porch. Megan looked over at me, her brow furrowing. 
She reached out as well, touching the same invisible barrier. It's real, she whispered. Before I could say anything, a deep echoing voice filled the air behind us. You can't leave. I froze. Slowly I turned around, and standing in the doorway of the cabin was a figure, tall, gaunt, and unmistakably skeletal. Its bones were a sickly yellow, like they'd been rotting for centuries, and its eye sockets glowed with a dim, unnatural light. You've opened the passage. It began. The Necronomicon has called forth the gates of hell. Megan stepped forward, her eyes wide. What do you mean? She asked. The skeleton tilted its head toward her, amused. The ritual has bound this cabin to hell, sweetheart. It is no longer a part of your world. And so, one of you must stay behind forever. The word echoed in my mind like a death sentence. Stay forever in this place. Megan turned to me then, her face full of sweetness. Oh, honey, you understand, don't you? I know you'll do the right thing. You always do. She reached out, resting her hand on my arm, her eyes glistening. I won't forget your sacrifice. I stared at her, my mind spinning. Sacrifice. She actually expected me to give up my life here, to stay trapped in hell so she could go free. She smiled at me, the same smile that had made me think she was so sweet, so smart, so perfect when we'd first met. I thought about it, how beautiful she was, how enchanting she'd seemed when she pulled me into her world, how she'd made me feel special, you know, like I was part of something amazing. But then again, all this shit was her idea. She was clearly insane. And let's be real, I'd only known her for three weeks. My gaze hardened as I looked over at her. The smile faded from Megan's face as she saw that look in my eyes. Wait, she began. But before she could finish, I kicked her right in the chest. She had it coming and I sent her flying into the doorway of the cabin. She hit the floor with a gasp, right at the feet of the skeleton, and she looked up at me in total shock. The skeleton's bony hands reached down, gripping her shoulders. Megan's eyes widened in fear as the creature dragged her further back into the cabin. Help me, she began. But her words were cut off as the air itself seemed to ripple. The cabin began to groan and shudder, the walls twisting and warping. I watched as the floor beneath Megan cracked open, a fiery red light spilling out from the depths below. The thing dragged her into the heart of the cabin. The walls began to twist, collapsing inward as if the entire structure was being sucked into hell. Megan's last scream echoed through the night as the cabin and everything inside it was swallowed up and then silence. I stood there on the porch, staring at the empty space where the cabin and my girlfriend, well, ex-girlfriend now, I guess, had been. The only thing left behind was the book, the Necronomicon, lying on the ground where Megan had dropped it. I walked over to it slowly, picking it up, 
The leather felt warm in my hands, like it was pulsing with some kind of life. Without thinking, I turned and walked toward the shed near the edge of the clearing. Inside, I found an old shovel. My hand still trembling, I began to dig. The earth was soft, and the hole came together quickly. Deep enough. It had to be deep enough. When the hole was finished, I dropped the book into it, watching as the dirt filled the space, burying the Necronomicon beneath the earth. When I was done, I packed the dirt down with a shovel, and I wiped the sweat from my brow. There was another cabin nearby, just a bit deeper into the woods. I knew the place well. It was a party spot where teenagers came on weekends to drink, the kind of place people forgot about after summer ended. Nobody would find the book here. At least that's what I told myself. I leaned on the shovel, staring down at the freshly dug hole. The night was quiet again, as if nothing had happened. And for the first time since we'd arrived, I, I felt free. Now this all happened years ago. I don't like to think about it much anymore. The cabin, Megan, the book. But sometimes it creeps back into my mind, especially on nights when the air feels thick and heavy, like it did in that clearing. When the woods get too quiet, when the darkness around you feels like it's pressing in. After I buried the Necronomicon, I left. I didn't go back to my apartment. I didn't go back to the life I'd had before. How could I? I packed a bag, got in my car, and I just drove. No destination. Just away. I figured if I stayed on the move, I'd keep ahead of whatever we'd unleash that night. I could feel it wasn't over. I could feel something coming for me. The nightmare started a week later. Visions of Megan being pulled down into the earth, her face twisted in terror, her screams cutting through the sound of cracking bones and roaring fire. A couple of years after I disappeared from the life I used to know, I heard rumors about strange things happening near that cabin. Weird disappearances. People talking about strange creatures in the woods. But I didn't go back. Not for anything. I tried to forget. Then about a year later, I saw a report on the news. Some kids, a group of teenagers, had gone up to the woods to party. The same woods. The reports didn't mention the cabin specifically, but I knew exactly where they'd been. The local authorities found their bodies scattered in pieces, torn apart like animals. The reporter kept his voice steady, but the footage in the background told a different story. Bloody, ragged limbs, blank, staring eyes, Whatever had killed them wasn't human. And then, they mentioned the one body that was never recovered. One of the kids had survived, at least for a while. Witnesses, people who lived nearby, said they heard someone screaming long after the others had died, screaming and laughing like he'd gone mad. He'd fought back, or so they guessed. The police combed the area for days, but all they found was blood. Lots of it. I forget that kid's name. Adam? Aaron? I know it was an A name. Anyways, the kids, the cabin, the unspeakable violence. It had all started again. I knew it. And I knew why. The Necronomicon buried deep in the woods, had been found again. I tried to convince myself that no one could have unearthed it, that no one would even think to dig where I'd buried it. But something inside me knew better. I hadn't stopped it. I'd only paused it.
The news stopped covering the story after a while. The murders got chalked up to some unsolved tragedy. An animal attack, they said. But I know what it was. And I know it's not over. Some nights when I think about that cabin, I can almost hear the dead clawing at the walls of the earth, trying to break free again. They never stop. And they're always waiting. If anyone ever finds that book again, God help them. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you like true scary stories, we just started a second channel called Lighthouse, where I tell true scary stories on camera every single night, seven nights a week at 8 p.m. New York time. Uh, we have some crazy true scary stories over there. So if that's your thing. Come on by. You can click on the icon or we have a link in the description. Thank you so much for watching. I hope everybody's doing really well and I'll see you soon.